Good evening, everyone. I'm Pat Jetty, and president of the Salisbury Forum, and along with our board of directors, I'm very happy to welcome all of you here to the program this evening. We, uh, we know this is a busy time of year, and we have changed the date for this program from Friday to Saturday, and we're an hour earlier. So thank you so much for joining us uh, for this program with Joshua Goldstein. After this evening, we're going to take a short summer break, uh, but we will be back with three programs for the fall, starting on September 27th with a panel of educators from our three local high schools, Salisbury School, Housatonic Valley Regional High School, and Hotchkiss, and they will be discussing how they are using artificial intelligence to educate their students and what difference that is making. In October, we have David Kirkpatrick, who is formerly of the New York Times, and he is going to provide his insights on how the media is covering the 2024 presidential election. And by that time, we all, we will not be able to avoid the topic. So, and then finally, on November 22nd, we have William Cohan, who is a formal, former journalist who had a career on Wall Street and then began publishing books, he, a number of books on finance, and one of which was House of Cards. So we look forward to the fall season. There will be information in a couple of weeks uh, on all of these programs up on our website. I also wanted to call your attention to a developing section of our website, a small section, which is going to be right below the program descriptions. Uh, right now, we're calling it continuing the conversation. Because often um, we are covering complex and evolving issues that stay in the media. The, the speakers stay in the media, the topics stay in the media. Um, and for example, in January of 2023, we held a screening of a film called The Vow from Hiroshima. And afterwards, we had a discussion with the film's producer and the main character in the film, who was a survivor of Hiroshima. She was four years old when the bomb was dropped. And she went on to devote her life to getting a nuclear ban uh, treaty passed, actually, at the United Nations and now uh, signed by 50 countries. So we're happy to let you know that this film is now going to be aired on PBS, on public television. Uh, so watch our website for the Times or your local public TV stations for uh, an, an ability to see that film again or, or introduce it to your family or friends. As all of you know, our programs are free and open to the public. Uh, and we encourage you to make your contributions throughout the year. You can go to our website, salisburyforum.org, and hit the donate button. We take checks, credit cards, PayPal, stock donations, or you could do the old-fashioned way of putting cash or a check in here and handing it to somebody at our welcome table. As you know, we don't have staff, so your, all your contributions go a very long way in covering the expenses of bringing our speakers to you. This evening's topic is how nuclear power can play a major role in reducing greenhouse gases in time to avoid, hopefully, to avoid a climate chaos. I hope many of you have had a chance to take a look at or view all of the film called Nuclear Now, which is available on our website and will remain there until May 19th. Our speaker tonight, Joshua Goldstein, co-wrote this film with Oliver Stone. And I watched it last weekend. I have to say I was pretty fascinated and discovered how my opinions about nuclear power might be outdated. Maybe a few of you attended the 1979 No, no Nukes concert that is featured in the film and took place on landfill made from the uh, uh, construction of the Twin Towers in Lower Manhattan. As you are going to hear this evening, though, times have changed since 1979, and certainly the climate stakes are much higher. So we are really happy to have Joshua Goldstein with us this evening 
to provide his perspectives. As a seasoned academic, Dr. Goldstein is Professor Emeritus in International Relations at American University in Washington and a research scholar at UMass Amherst. He's written widely on war and its impacts, including several award-winning books, one called War and Gender, or another one called Winning the War on War, The Decline of Armed Conflict Worldwide. But in addition to international relations, his expertise also includes energy and climate change. And his book published in 2019 called The Bright Future, which will be available for sale uh, by Avalon Books after our program, describes how several nations have had positive experiences, very positive experiences, using nuclear power to decarbonize their energy production. Professor Goldstein earned a bachelor's degree from Stanford and a PhD from MIT. So please join me in welcoming Joshua Goldstein. Thank you very much. My granddaughter turns two next month. And statistically speaking, she's likely to live through the rest of this century and a little bit into the next century. So I'm thinking long term. I'm thinking about the century that is going to be her century, the 21st, and how we're setting it up for her. Spoiler alert, not very well so far. Um, she's the 15th generation Massachusetts citizen. I'm 13th generation. And so, forgive me if I have a long-term view. And climate change is going to be the big issue that will shape the rest of this century. Not in the way that people talk about it. It's, climate change is here, it's right now, we have to do everything in the next five years. That's not exactly right. Um, the opening scenes of the film are beginning to unfold now, but what's coming is much, much worse, much, much more serious if we don't get our hands around this problem, and we haven't yet, as I'll show. The long-term perspective, and I'm going to give you a fair amount of data, so bear with me. I'm a professor, I like numbers, and I, there's a lot of talk about climate change. I don't want to give you ideology, I don't want to give you narratives, I want to give you the hard facts, and they're pretty brutal. This is the only metric that really matters, the rate at which we're emitting carbon in the atmosphere for the last 250 years. This is when I was born, apparently precipitating the entire crisis. <laughs> this is when the countries of the world got together in Rio in 1992 to decide to really do something about this problem, the Earth Summit. And this is the, adding on the latest year's data, an all-time high. And you'll see that sometimes it goes up and flattens out and goes up and flattens out. We're in a little bit of a flat lately, but now it's going back up again. Um, but it's inexorable. We're putting more carbon in the atmosphere all the time, and it's driving global warming. Now, you might think that if we just flattened out the carbon that we're putting at the at Know, like that, uh, that that would mean the temperatures would flatten out. But it's not like that. The temperatures are driven by the amount of carbon in the atmosphere. It was 315 parts per million when I was born, and now it's 425, and it's going up. If we flatten this out, it means we're putting it in every year at today's record rate. That's not going to work. That's not good enough. The climate scientists tell us we need to bring it down fast by the middle of the century. And that's an enormous undertaking. Now, if we unpack this world total, there are two very different things going on, different parts of the world. In the Western industrialized parts of the world, primarily North America and Europe, um, that's one billion of the world's eight billion people. One billion out of eight. And there, it's doing just that flattening out. And even coming down a little bit, in another 80 or 100 years, we might decarbonize these parts of the world. But that's not what matters. Nothing that's happening in this part of the world that matters 
It's this other group of countries in Asia. Five billion out of the eight billion people live there. Two thirds of the carbon emissions are coming from Asia, and especially China. You can see the emissions in China went jumping up after 2001 when China joined the World Trade Organization and started to make all our stuff for us with coal. Um, and then the rest of Asia, the big fast growing countries like Indonesia, Pakistan, Bangladesh, Vietnam, they all are trying to lift up out of poverty the way China has done and it's a wonderful thing. Hundreds of millions and billions of people coming up out of poverty and getting their feet under them and having a better life but they're doing it by burning fossil fuels. And then India at the bottom there, the big one, coming along, they want a better life, they want all those things that make life better, and they're burning coal to do it. If we look just at coal, it's half of the world's emissions coming from coal, and half the coal in the world is burned in China. I'd like to talk about this San Francisco, Oakland Bay Bridge, assembled in the Bay Area from parts that were made in China with coal, so built with coal, assembled in California, and then California's like, we don't burn coal. <laughs> we have people for that. But coal's only one of the fossil fuels, and you'll see that we get energy from three of them in roughly equal parts, coal, oil, and gas. And each one of those three over the last 50 years is growing. And then up at the top, we have the big energy transition, solar and wind. Not very important yet and growing really fast, but not fast enough to even keep up with the growing demand for energy in the world. Not even to keep up with demand, much less to displace the coal, oil, and gas, and much less to do that really quickly. It's not happening. So, most, I want to talk about electricity, and, and most of the energy, most of the carbon emissions are not coming from the generation of electricity, they're actually coming from industry transportation heating, things like coal-powered steel furnaces and gas and diesel vehicles and gas and oil that you heat your home with and so forth. Um, and then down in the bottom part of agriculture, land use deforestation, an important part of the problem, but kind of a different set of issues and different set of solutions, like feeding seaweed to your cattle and stuff. It's important, but it's, it's not my problem, it's somebody else's problem. So I'm not gonna talk about it, not in those totals I just gave you, and we'll maybe have another lecture on the importance of agricultural and forest policy and climate change, but that won't be tonight. Um, but the electricity is tremendously important because if you can generate electricity cleanly, then you can electrify that right-hand side that's so important. You can make electric arc furnaces for steel, you can make electric vehicles, you can make electric heat pumps for heating your home, etc. And you can keep up with growing demand. Electricity demand is going to grow tremendously, mostly because of those big countries that are rising up out of poverty and using more and more energy. And also because we need to capture carbon from the atmosphere, we need to desalinate a lot of water as climate change uh, cuts into the water supplies around the world. And the latest thing, the data centers, very, very hungry for energy and blowing out all the decarbonization plans that anybody has because there's more demand for electricity. So we're gonna need probably three to as much as five times the electricity by 2050 that we use today. And we have a wonderful app that you can get on your phone, but please not right now. Um, called Electricity Maps, and it'll show you in near real time how the electricity is being generated and how cleanly it's being generated all over the world, except the little places like China that don't report their data. Um, and you can see who's generating how many grams of carbon in the atmosphere for every kilowatt hour of electricity that's made. So how clean is that kilowatt hour? And you'll see that even countries that are very close together, like Sweden and Poland, have very, very different levels of uh, carbon emissions in generating their electricity. Now, Poland is no mystery, they mostly burn coal there. And that makes it you know, very dark, very dirty, a lot of grams of carbon going up for each kilowatt hour. And that's also true in places like Wyoming, South Africa, India, uh, Southeast Asia, Australia, and China, which although they don't report the data, I added them in here, two-thirds coal for their electricity. 
Then on the other end, the green countries, the clean generators, are in two categories. Category one is countries that are lucky enough to have hydroelectric power. They have a lot of mountains, a lot of water, and they can generate electricity really cleanly. Places like Norway, Quebec, uh, British Columbia, Brazil, New Zealand, Tasmania, right? And then I give a shout out to Iceland, which is that sort of its own category that has geothermal. They're sitting on top of all this geothermal. You put a straw in the earth and get heat out. But nowhere else in the world has that, but Iceland, more power to them, they're really clean. And then the second category of these green countries is the ones that are doing nuclear power. Uh, Ontario, France, and Sweden actually has a combination of nuclear and hydroelectricity, which is a great combination. Completely clean grid. And then in between them are these shades of brown uh, wind and solar combined with gas or sometimes coal. It's usually gas. Germany was planning to switch to gas, but it was going to be Russian gas, and that didn't go so well. So now they're back burning their coal still. Um, but by getting off of coal and onto gas, and then mixing in wind and solar, you can bring down the emissions pretty substantially. Germany, about half of Poland, and uh, New England, less than that, and California, all the way down to a third of what Poland is. So going from a coal grid to a combination of wind and solar and gas, get two-thirds of your emissions out. And that sounds good, but I want to look at how this really breaks down in a couple of these grids. New England on the left, California on the right. In both cases, the grid is dominated by natural gas. Um, and there's also a fair amount of nuclear and hydropower. Those are your you know, day and night reliable, not weather dependent, forms of generation, and they're important on these grids. And then there's wind and solar, which in New England is pretty non-existent so far. We hope for offshore wind, but it hasn't developed yet. And in California, it's actually pretty substantial. They've got almost a third of their grid running on wind and solar. But, and this is true in a lot of grids around the world, the gas is more than the wind and solar combined. And that's not an accident because the wind and solar only produce part of the time, obviously. And when they stop producing, that's when the gas plants kick in. So they go hand in hand with each other. And it's described as an energy transition or a wind and solar transition of some kind, but it's actually a hybrid of wind and solar with gas or some other way to back it up. In Germany, as I said, they're using coal because the gas fell through. Um, and that hybrid is pretty low carbon compared to Poland, but it's not zero. And there's a couple of problems with this hybrid model. Let me show you. First of all, it, if you need to power a grid, let's just say a light bulb, 10 watt light bulb, and you want it to run all the time, you don't want the lights to go out. So if you don't build any wind and solar, you're going to need the full amount of gas that powers that light bulb, right? If you think, we'll be California, and we'll put in a third wind and solar, and the rest gas or something else, well, you still need to build the 10 watts of gas. You need the full amount to power the light bulb, because when the wind and solar don't produce, then you're going to need the full amount of gas. And what's true of this light bulb is true of the whole grid. If wind and solar stop, something needs to pick up the entire grid. And that means you need an entire backup system of uh, gas or something uh, to keep the grid running at the times the wind and solar are not producing. If you build the entire amount in wind and solar, fine when they're producing. As soon as they stop, you need the entire amount from gas. And if you build any amount of wind and solar, it doesn't matter because at night, on a windless night, um, they'll be zero and you'll need to build everything out of gas. So that's very expensive to do. And there's a paradox that wind and solar are very cheap, the cheapest thing out there at the moment that they're producing. But when you build a grid around them, it becomes the most expensive thing out there because you need this whole backup system. If it's gas, if it's batteries, coal, something that's going to keep your grid running the rest of the time when your very cheap thing isn't operating. 
And who loves this? The natural gas companies, committed to renewables, committed to natural gas. Um, and of course, the more wind and solar you put on, the more natural gas facilities you're going to build. And they like that. And they're not shy about it. This is from the American Petroleum Institute. Why natural gas will thrive in the age of renewables, right? So, and gas has another problem too, which is it consists of methane. That's what natural gas is. And when it escapes in the atmosphere unburned, which happens quite a lot from the well ahead all the way to turning your stove on and having it go click and click before it lights, that's not very much, there's more of the well ahead. Um, when it gets into the atmosphere, it's a very powerful greenhouse gas, 80 times more powerful than carbon dioxide. It only lasts about 12 years, and carbon dioxide lasts hundreds of years. So it's a problem that we will be able to solve eventually, but in the short term, between now and 2050, it's really pushing the warming of the Earth. It's pretty alarming, uh, more and more methane. This is a problem that governments have woken up to. There's some policy efforts underway. The Environmental Defense Fund even has their own satellite tracking where methane is leaking from so they can crack down on it. That's all good, but we haven't solved the problem yet. That's not the real problem with this model, though. The real problem is, if you, put, if you go from coal to gas in a growing grid, as we have, you need three to five times the amount of electricity. And if you cut the emissions by half, or even down to a third, but you have three to five times the electricity, your emissions are gonna go up, right? You can't solve emissions by having less per kilowatt hour and more kilowatt hours. Um, now, if you try to use batteries for this, then you won't have that problem. But you have another problem with batteries, which is that they're uh, very, very expensive to meet the long periods when wind and solar might not be producing. You have monsoon season in Asia, you've got the long winters in New England, times when you could go a couple of weeks without production of wind and solar. If you're gonna to try to cover that with batteries, you're going to have a vast amount of batteries that are going to sit unused most of the time to kick in during those times when you need them. I don't know the right number, but it's in the trillions of dollars every year to do this, and it's not going to happen. And certainly a country like India is not going to go down a route that's that expensive when they can burn coal instead for much cheaper. And I don't blame them. You know, they need to bring people out of poverty um, by whatever means they can. And then the other problem with this wind, solar, battery combination is China owns this space. They make all that stuff. And the supply chain is not great, from the mining in the Democratic Republic of Congo to the genocide against the Uyghurs in China, where they're producing all this stuff with coal. So now you remember back to this graph, and you say, aha, maybe this is why wind and solar are not taking over the grid. We have a problem. I'm sorry, Joshua. It looks like your granddaughter is screwed, and there's nothing we can do about it. And then you begin to cast about. Maybe there's a miracle that will save us. And there are some that I hope will save us. Uh, I'm going to mention a few of them. Deep geothermal, go deep enough, you can find energy. Um, there are companies, there's a pilot plant out west that is producing electricity from deep geothermal. Uh, carbon capture either from the atmosphere, there's a pilot plant doing that in Iceland, or capture the carbon from uh, natural gas. You burn the natural gas and capture the carbon, there's a pilot plant doing that in Texas right now. Uh, long duration batteries also, there's pilot efforts to do that. Very problematic when you need it to last you know, all winter, but it, it can be done. And fusion power coming along got to get something hotter than the sun and then contain it from touching anything and it's tricky to do that. But there are companies that are working on that and I sure hope they come through. I hope one of these or all of them come through because we could sure use them. Um, but the question is, will they be cheap enough to compete with coal in those big Asian economies that are growing so fast? And that I'm not so sure about and I certainly don't want to risk my granddaughter's future on them. And then geoengineering has the opposite problem. It's actually very cheap and, and proven. It's been done because volcanoes do it all the time. You put little particles of sulfur into the air, it reflects sunlight, and it cools the earth down. 
but it's quite problematic because it'll mess with the world's weather systems in unpredictable ways. And as soon as you stop doing it, all the temperature rise catches up with you all at once, which is actually the one thing that's worse than what we're doing now, just driving them up year by year. Um, the sudden change would be really, really bad. So that's problematic. And then you think back, what do we have that might work? And you remember this slide, hopefully, from a few minutes ago, that, oh, there are places that have cleaned up their grid with nuclear power. Nuclear, of all things. I'm an old California environmentalist. I always hated nuclear power until I started getting concerned with climate change and then began to learn about these topics. So here's what it looks like. Nuclear. To the grid, it looks like coal. It's, it's uh, reliable 24-7, not affected by weather, et cetera. Um, but unlike coal, it's uh, carbon-free and doesn't produce the awful smoke. You know, coal smoke kills millions of people every year from emphysema, cancer, and heart disease horrible deaths, but all spread out, not very newsworthy. Um, and nuclear doesn't do any of that. This is the Baraka plant in the United Arab Emirates, which the Koreans just built. Took about 12 years. It's a very big plant, the biggest reactor in the world just about, and there's four of them in the plant. 12 years, on time, on budget. Koreans know how to build this stuff. Um, and with 600 of these plants, you could power all the electricity in the world today. And you probably need 1,200 more to catch up with when electricity triples, right? But it, it could be done. That's, that's a, a possible option. Now, I know what you're thinking. Nuclear power is scary. And it's scary for a reason, because billions of dollars have been spent making us afraid of nuclear power over decades. And no worse offender than Hollywood in this regard. All the, the, that octopus there stands in for a whole bunch of monster movies in the 1950s where radioactive something or other, apparently what it does is make animals very much larger and a lot angrier. <laughs> and then they wreak havoc and this all comes out of the dangers of radioactivity. Um, so we're, we're afraid of nuclear, that is a real problem. But the people who don't like nuclear have a, you know, I call it the litany of sins, the reasons that, that, and I believed all this myself until recently, 10 years ago. Uh, nuclear power is too dirty, especially the waste. It's too dangerous, just look at all the accidents. It's uh, too slow to deploy and too expensive. Now I will say, what big capital concrete laying project is not too slow to deploy and too expensive? It is at the Tappan Zee Bridge, the big dig in Boston, the high speed rail in California, and all these kind of projects in the industrial West are always slow and over budget. In China, they can build nuclear reactors in five years, not 10 or 15 here, and they do it on a budget and they're putting a new reactor on the grid every few months in China. Not enough because they're also putting coal plants on the grid constantly, uh, as well as a lot of wind and solar. Um, but I wanna go through these quickly um, starting with nuclear power is too dirty, just look at the waste. Um, the wonderful thing about nuclear power is how concentrated it is. And if you look at the throughput of material that it takes to produce electricity from any of these means, nuclear is by far the smallest and way smaller than coal, certainly. Less mining, less transportation, with smaller power plants, less fuel burned, and less waste at the other end, all because it's so concentrated. This is how concentrated it is. A U.S. aircraft carrier with 6,000 people on board, a whole city, um, traveling at 35 miles an hour, weighing 100,000 tons, uh, filled with combat aircraft. The whole thing is powered by two nuclear reactors, small ones, that would fit in this auditorium. So imagine this auditorium can power all of that. Try doing that with diesel or whatever. Um, and it doesn't need refueling for years at a time. When you put that into a power plant, it looks something like this. This is the South Korean reactor, four of which made that plant in the United Arab Emirates. Produces 10 billion kilowatt hours per year. Without getting too technical, that's a lot of electricity from one reactor. One little building like that. And the fuel for it, for a year, fits onto a truck. If you try to do the same thing with coal, it would be 25,000 railroad cars per year. 
If you tried to do the same thing with solar power, it would be all the solar cells in this picture times 300. And then, for reasons I explained earlier, you'd need natural gas plants to back it up for when the solar wasn't producing. Sometimes it would be way more than you need, and other times nothing at all. And the natural gas plant. And then, to site those solar plants, or the solar arrays, you need to clear cut the forests if you live in New England. This is my town in Western Massachusetts, the town next door to one, you know, hundreds of acres of mature forest, clear cut to put in solar cells. And we don't get much sun in New England, really. So, to me, this is an environmental nightmare. This is an environmental dream. Such a compact footprint, such a small site, so little throughput, and so little waste at the other end. One of these reactors produces three of these turds, if I may, per year, and they are 18 foot high concrete and steel cylinders with the spent nuclear fuel in them. They sit on a pad out back, usually some dozens of them as the plant goes along, and they sit there. Do you know nobody in the world ever has been harmed by spent nuclear fuel? It's supposed to be so dangerous and so dirty and terrible. Nobody's ever been harmed by it. These things will withstand anything, earthquakes, airplanes, floods, you name it. Um, and they're certified for 100 years, which is hopefully enough time to solve climate change. And then we can come up with the longer term uh, solutions, what we're going to do with this new spent nuclear fuel, either put it deep underground the way Finland is doing right now, or recycle it into new fuel for reactors the way France is doing right now, or use it as fuel for new kinds of reactors as they're just starting to do at the Idaho National Laboratory now. These are all practical things to do with the spent fuel, but it's safe for right now. When we have big problems right now to solve, and these casks sitting on uh, concrete pads behind nuclear plants are not doing anyone any harm. How do we treat coal waste? It's a little bit different. We throw it into the atmosphere, people choke on it and die. It creates uh, climate change from the carbon pollution. And then what's not is it going up in smoke is thrown into ponds, toxic coal ash, next to bodies of water, and these uh, coal, the coal waste contains arsenic, lead, cadmium, mercury, all these very, very toxic elements, and they last forever. Nuclear waste gets less dangerous over time because radioactivity has a half-life, and it gets less so over time. These things do not get less dangerous. They'll be here a million years from now, the toxic lead, cadmium, and so forth, and they do harm people. Okay, so they say it's dirty, especially the waste. It's actually squeaky clean, especially the waste. There's so little of it. The waste from all the nuclear plants, spent fuel from all the plants in the United States, over 70 years, producing 20% of our electricity. It's a lot of electricity. The spent fuel from that, if you took it out of these casks and put it all together, which you wouldn't because it would get too hot, but just for volumetric analysis here, put it all together in one place, it would fit in a Walmart. Right? 20 years, 20% of our, I mean, 70 years, 20% of our electricity fit in Walmart. It's a tiny amount of problem. It's literally a small problem. Tiny amount of material. Okay, but isn't it dangerous? Just look at the accidents. Fukushima, Fukushima, ah. Um, and if you look at the data, it's actually hundreds of times safer than our main way of making electricity right now in the world, which is coal. 400 times safer. And all of those deaths from nuclear power came from one accident 40 years ago at Chernobyl. That was really a bad accident. And uh, there was no containment structure in that power plant, which we now have in all the power plants that we build these days. Uh, and radiation got out because of that. There was a highly radioactive fire. People were sent in to fight that fire without adequate protective gear. They got very high doses of radiation and some of them died from it. Over 100 people died. And then lower level radiation spread around Europe and everybody freaked out, I think is the technical term for it. Um, but if you look at how many people actually got 100 times background, and I'll tell you why that's significant in a minute, 
Um, it's actually just that one area around Chernobyl. Everybody else is getting levels of radiation that are either at or below or some multiple, but not a very big multiple, of our background radiation. Now, background radiation at the bottom here is three millisieverts per year. Some places it's lower, one or two millisieverts, and other places it's higher. But we live in a planet full of radiation. Cosmic rays are coming from above. Radiation from radioactive elements in the Earth is coming up from below. And this room is full of radiation right now. Right? So that normal background is higher if you live in Denver or somewhere else at altitude because your the atmosphere is not um, taking out as many of the cosmic rays. Or if you work on a high elevation um, airline route and you get radiation when you fly an airplane just from being up there. And it varies a lot from one place to another and around the Earth. The highest in the Earth is Ramsar, Iran. They have radium hot springs, and the people live there year-round at this level, you know, 100 times higher than the background in other places in the world. So a hundred-fold variation. And of course, scientists have swarmed into Ramsar, Iran over the years to find what the health effects are, and they haven't found any health effects. Nothing in this range has ever been shown to affect human health. Low-level radiation. And I have another entire lecture, maybe it'll be a book or a film someday, about why we're afraid of low-level radiation and why that's not right. But the, the summary is that all these fears of low-level radiation come from a theory that DNA cannot repair itself. And therefore, little hits from a little, little bit of radiation uh, cause permanent damage to your DNA. We now know definitively, including a Nobel Prize within the last decade, that DNA does repair itself, and it does so in wondrous ways, very complex mechanisms. But um, low-level radiation is not dangerous. But to be on the safe side, the authorities have set a limit for medical scans or people working in the nuclear industry or so forth. You should try to limit yourself to a quarter of what the people in Ramsar and Iran are getting, so 50 millisieverts. And at the Fukushima plant, when that terrible accident happened, the public was never exposed to a level of radiation higher than that. Nobody was killed by the nuclear accident at Fukushima. Nobody had enough radiation to cause health harm in that accident. There was a terrible accident in Fukushima. It was a natural disaster. It killed 18,000 people. The biggest earthquake and tsunami Japan has ever experienced, and they have a lot of earthquakes. Wiped out everything. Most of the nuclear plants were fine. They're very hardy. Uh, the one in Fukushima, one of them was badly designed. The generators flooded. The uh, uh, power went out because of that. The core melted down. The hydrogen gas built up and exploded. I mean, it's pretty much the hardest, bad as you can get, right? starting with a 100-foot high tsunami um, and ending with a hole in the containment and some radiation getting out, but it was never above that level that is set for occupational exposure. Um, nonetheless, they evacuated everybody from the area, and from a big area, because they were afraid of the low-level radiation out there. And they took all these large number of people and kept them away from their homes for years. Smoking rates went up, uh, suicide rates went up, depression went up, and uh, a couple thousand people died as a result of that evacuation. So, and then Japan stopped all their nuclear power plants, shut everything down, and switched over to fossil fuel, including coal. And that killed people from breathing in coal smoke. So the, the math of it is 18,000 people killed by a natural disaster, a couple thousand killed by a botched evacuation, and uh, about 10,000 killed from the coal smoke from shutting down all your nuclear plants, and nobody from the actual <coughs> nuclear power plant. And yet, we think of it as a nuclear disaster. There was no nuclear disaster in Fukushima. There was a nuclear power plant accident, but that wasn't what caused all this uh, death and devastation. All right, so you say it's dangerous. Look at all the accidents. I say it's the safest, actually, of all of the ways of generating electricity. Nothing is 100% safe. People did die in Chernobyl, et cetera. But far, far safer than the other ways, and especially the main way, coal. 
Now, is it too slow to deploy? Absolutely the opposite. If we look at what France did in the 1970s, the oil crises of the 70s convinced France that they needed an alternative to or importing all their oil from the Middle East for energy security reasons. They didn't even think about climate change yet. And so they just built 56 reactors really fast. And they switched their grid from primarily fossil fuel to overwhelmingly nuclear in about 15 years. Very, very fast. And it wasn't an anomaly. If you look at all the efforts to add clean energy, clean electricity to grids around the world, those countries that did it the fastest, nine out of the 10 used nuclear power to do that. It is the fastest way to get clean energy onto the grid. And that Barakat plant with the uh, you know, four reactors that was built in 12 years is a good example of that. <coughs> so, slow to deploy? No, it's the fastest to deploy. And is it expensive? And this is a very important question because if it is expensive, it's not going to displace coal. This is why the solar and wind and batteries and those things are not being built like crazy. Uh, they are being built like crazy, but not enough to displace the coal in, in Asia. Um, so we need it to be cheap. And South Korea had this experience as they built more reactors of similar design. The cost came down considerably. That last dot at the end of the dotted line, that's the Barakat plant. The International Energy Agency has cost projections for different ways of generating. Nuclear is kind of in the middle of it. It's not insanely expensive. It's cheaper than offshore wind, um, and especially because off this is from a few years ago, and now offshore wind prices have, have gone way up since then. Um, it's not as cheap as utility scale solar, but when it produces, um, but you know, it's about equal with hydro. It's in the middle of the pack now. If we get a lot of it, if we put our minds to making it cheap, um, we could get it down cheaper than coal for sure. And if you look at the countries that have built nuclear versus those that are using coal, um, actually, the ones using nuclear, France and Sweden, are cheaper electricity. France has been having cheaper electricity than Germany for the whole time that Germany's been trying to run an energy transition and France has been running nuclear plants. So it's not expensive, it's affordable and could be the cheapest. It's very important that we get it cheap. All right, I'm going to add number five of the four points on the litany. Not talking about much these days, but it'll probably come back in as an anti-nuclear argument because these things kind of rotate through. Um, and that is that if we build nuclear plants, we'll end up proliferating nuclear weapons. The countries that have nuclear weapons, the big five on the left, the Security Council members, and then the four on the right, and Iran undoubtedly trying to get one, um, of those four, the rogue ones on the right, Israel and North Korea don't even have civilian nuclear power programs. And India and Pakistan have the programs, but they're separate from the military program. If they want plutonium to build nuclear weapons with, which they do, they build a plutonium reactor to generate plutonium to build nuclear weapons. It's not effective or, or cost effective to try to build nuclear weapons using a civilian nuclear power plant. And over the years, civilian nuclear power has not contributed to the spread of nuclear weapons. The two were somewhat linked in the early days of the Cold War because the new technology was being developed to build bombs, and then they adapted it um, for power plants. But these days, they are not connected with each other. Now, the issue of nuclear weapons is a very important one, don't get me wrong. And stopping proliferation is extremely important. It's the reason that I went into international relations, went back to MIT in 1982 to figure out how to deal with the problem of war. And I made friends with Randy Forsberg, who started the nuclear freeze movement. It's an issue very close to my heart and extremely important. But what I did learn over time is that um, it's not the same thing as nuclear power plants. Nuclear weapons and power plants are not the same. We were all confused about that back in the day, and I think I've got some clarity on it now. But what I do want to do is bomb these coal plants with nuclear reactors. That's a, that's a good kind of bomb. I want to take out coal plants. I want coal plant killers that are, that are nuclear reactors. And the most important thing in uh, developing nuclear reactors that can do this in the big Asian countries, in the coal burning countries, in the poor countries that 
that need energy. Most important thing is not safety. We're hundreds of times safer than anything else. If we had a Chernobyl accident every year, well, I better not say this would be bad, but you know, it would still be much safer than coal, right? So we don't need it to be safer. What we need is for it to be cheaper. That's the key to the whole thing. And that's behind this uh, move to develop new kinds of reactors that can be built more cheaply. This one, a company called Thorcon, wants to build these uh, pretty large reactors in shipyards in South Korea. They're very good at cranking out high quality stuff in a whole cruise ship or a natural gas transporting ship. They can crank them out very cheaply and efficiently. And so they could do this with nuclear plants. This company has a great design for the reactor. They're hoping to sell the electricity at three cents a kilowatt hour. That'll kill a coal plant. Um, and they've got a customer in Indonesia. They, Indonesia wants these. Uh, but they need a billion dollars to build the first one. And nobody's come up with it yet. And if you have a billion dollars and you're looking to invest in a clean energy technology, I'd recommend this company. Um, I'm not sure they're going to make it, but there are other. There's a Danish company that's trying to do the same thing, and China's trying to do the same thing. So this idea will catch on. Building shipyards, take it to where it's going, plug it in at the shoreline to the grid. Or you go to the smaller reactors. Um, they can be built in factories and cost less up front to build. So right now, you need to put in that billion dollars at the beginning. But with these smaller reactors, you can build a smaller reactor for less money that's not really any advantage, but it's faster. You can build it in a couple of years, two or three years, get it onto the grid, start generating electricity, start making money, plow that back in. It's a much more attractive business proposition. And there are dozens of companies trying to do this um, by going smaller with their reactors. And maybe the smaller ones will be less scary, too, than those big cooling towers and all of that. So here's a couple of possible coal pillars um, that are uh, just coming into fruition now and in the upcoming years. The General Electric on the left and Westinghouse on the right, these are two memorable old companies with a lot of experience building nuclear reactors. The GE Hitachi, they're both 300 megawatts. That's by comparison about one fifth the size of that great big South Korean reactor at the power cut plant. And the General Electric one, they've started moving Earth around. They're building it in Ontario, Canada. The Westinghouse one they haven't started building yet, but it's proving technology. They're smaller, they're less scary. It's a seven acre site, so not very big, and no big cooling tower and all of that. Um, and they hope to build them two to three years at less than a billion dollars each. So these I have some hope for. And then at the even smaller end, there's a company called Oaklo and a number of others, but Oaklo is on my mind because they went public yesterday at their IPO, um, raised $300 million out of it, so they're going to have some money to invest moving forward. And they want to build this small reactor, and they want to own and operate it and just sell the electricity to a community. They think it'll be much more attractive to a community to not have to come up with a lot of money up front and to not have some big thing stuck in their backyard, but to put one of these in and sell them the electricity. And then at the very small end, this Westinghouse, very interesting micro reactor, they call it a nuclear battery. Five megawatts, so half a percent of the size of the big reactor. And um, it's a two acre site and pretty cheap to build, $60 million. And then they can just put it in and it runs for eight to 10 years and then they take it back out again and replace it with a new one. They call it a nuclear battery. These could go everywhere and anywhere if we weren't afraid of them. And it's possible that we won't be afraid of them because they're inherently extremely safe. It's a different, I'm not going to talk about different reactor types, but it's a, the physics of it make it impossible to melt down. These new reactors can actually burn as fuel the spent fuel from the old reactors. So instead of sitting around on the casks, we can use them as fuel. Uh, Oak is the company that has the contract to start doing that at Idaho National Lab now. So there's a lot of potential here. I don't know how fast these are going to come on, and I don't know if they'll be cheap enough. But with the mass production of something smaller, instead of these big concrete laying, you know, high speed rail type of projects, um, I'm pretty hopeful for those. Um, Oak 
that I just mentioned went public with uh, the cooperation of the guy who's the head of OpenAI. So big AI guy, Sam Altman. He's the big investor in it. And a number of these nuclear companies are, just this year, going crazy making agreements with data centers, data companies. You look at a data center, it just needs so much electricity. This is what's happening in Connecticut right now. You have the Millstone Nuclear Power Plant, nuclear reactors, and right adjacent to it, on the site, is a proposed data center the size of eight Walmart super centers, jam-packed with computers, and screaming, I want juice, I want juice, and you know, like right there next to the nuclear plant. So companies that are building data centers are now beginning to integrate nuclear reactors in with them. And that's a great thing, because the grid sure doesn't have energy to spare to give it to them. But uh, Oak is one that's certainly making agreements with various data centers now, and other companies are doing it too. Okay, so I want to go back to the New England grid here at the end and just talk about uh, what could be here in New England that would be useful. Um, as I said, our carbon emissions are so insignificant. We need something that can work in uh, the big Asian countries. But if we set a model for the big Asian countries, that would be useful. So how would that model look? What if we were to take our gas, 57%, and our nuclear, 24 That's the grid we have today in New England. And what if we were just to zero out the gas and do all of that with nuclear instead? We would have a grid that was 80% nuclear, with the rest being a mix of hydro, wind, and solar. And this isn't a proposal, it's not exactly how you do it, but it's the sort of the big picture of what the, our grid looks like. That would take something like seven gigawatts of new nuclear power to, to make up for that gas, something like $30 billion to build, and it would be about five of these really big South Korean reactors. Now there's four of them in that Barakat plant, so you're not talking about much more than what they just did in the United Arab Emirates. For that, you would get a carbon-free grid, reliable power, price stability. This is what um, companies want. They don't care so much about high cost of electricity, but they want stability. The last thing that any business wants is to go into a whole long-term business plan with one price of energy and then have it double on them. So this gives them price stability. This is why companies are moving into Georgia where the new nuclear plant is just built. And then uh, you created a model that the rest of the world can follow then, which is basically France 2.0. Build a bunch of nuclear reactors, do it really fast, decarbonize your grid. We could have a zero carbon grid here in England. As a matter of fact, some guy named Joshua Goldstein wrote this very idea in the Boston Globe five years ago. And it was generally studiously ignored and a little bit made fun of. Yeah, nuclear in Massachusetts, you know. But if we'd started in five years ago when I wrote that, we'd be almost halfway at decarbonizing our grid. We would have that Barakat plant under construction and the reactors beginning to come online one per year around you know, the end of the decade. So uh, instead, this is what we've done with our electricity over those five years. Grams per kilowatt hour, completely flat. We're not getting anywhere. But we could be doing what France did and decarbonize it really quickly. And that's what I want to be able to tell my granddaughter we did early in her life. We woke up and we decarbonized really quickly. We are like the kid who's in a house fire and sees this monster coming at them and goes and crawls into the bed and hides. And that's a fatal thing to do. Uh, it's some problem that firefighters work on now a lot with young children. Um, it looks ugly, but that's the thing that's going to save you. The thing that we fear is the thing that can save us. And you know, that ugly firefighter is nuclear power. The fire is climate change. And we have to come out from under our bed and wake up. So thank you very much. Get to have
Yes, that was a big mistake. The decommissioning of the Indian plant in North of New York. That plant was providing 25% of New York's electricity, and they decommissioned it and said they were going to replace it with renewables instead it was replaced 100% with natural gas, and that's what they're burning now for New York City. By the way, speaking of New York City, there's a lot of district heating in New York City. That's where you know, multiple buildings are all heated from a steam system. Um, also, college campuses have that, various places. And you could be heating New York City's district heating with nuclear power with these smaller reactors. Um, because heat <laughs> generates electricity, but then you have a lot of extra heat that goes, you have to get rid of somehow, it's just coming for free off the reactor. And you could heat district heat. So, so I haven't given you a lot of that. It's in the film, though. Um, if you watch the film Nuclear Now, uh, you know, the other uses of nuclear energy in addition to uh, just generating electricity. And one of them is to make district heat, and others to make industrial heat, um, and so forth. Yeah. Okay, where, where do we get our fuel for these plants if we make them? Yeah, the fuel originally comes from uranium, which is mined in, right now in a lot in Kazakhstan. Canada has a lot, Australia has a lot, the United States has some. Um, Uranium is pretty abundant around the world because it's a natural element, but some places have more and it's easier to get to. Those would probably be the main places where you get it from. But then you have to process it. Well, the Canadian reactors don't have to process it. They can use it in its natural state, but the others have to change the uh, proportion of the fissionable type of uranium compared to the rest of the uranium. Um, it's called enrichment, and that takes some doing. Uh, we were starting to get all that from Russia and got lazy and stopped doing it ourselves. And now suddenly Congress having just passed a law that we're going to start doing that ourselves because you know, we don't want to be buying that from Russia. But that's where the original comes from. Yeah. Uh, I, agree with, uh, I agree with you. And I'm a proponent of nuclear power in general concept. I'm still uncomfortable with the type of plants where if you lose power, they melt. And the newer type of plants where they they, you, lose, you lose cooling, they get hot and they self-regulate. That I'm comfortable with. But today's technology, it's like Indian coin, if you lose the power of the building, yeah, that still can't be. Yeah, well, the, uh, the reactor in Fukushima, they lost power and they melted down. But the containment kept the radiation contained. So it becomes a very expensive industrial accident, but you're not just blowing radiation out into the air like happened at Chernobyl. Um, the newer plants have passive safety where it'll keep it from melting down without any operator uh, intervention. Those would be like those cold killing 300 megawatt GE and Westinghouse plants. But then the new ones like the Oak Lowe and that, that little Westinghouse micro reactor, um, they're called fast reactors and they use fast neutrons instead of slowing the neutrons down. And the, the bottom line of that is that when the reactor heats up, the reaction slows down and stops. So it, it regulates itself. There was an experiment that we had one of these in Idaho um, way back decades ago that was the experimental breeder reactor, it's called. Um, and they did an experiment. They brought in nuclear experts from around the world. And they created the conditions that would have been the Fukushima accident, which hadn't happened yet. They shut off all the power. No operator did anything, the whole thing just, you know, stopped any uh, cooling of the reactor. And the temperature started to go up, the reaction started to go out of control. All these nuclear experts from around the world were looking at their local hosts to see who was going to run first. And then the temperature came down all by itself. That's the nature of the physics. And that's, that's that Oak Lowe plant will do that. It also has the advantage that, for the same principle, that it will regulate the amount of power that's putting out according to the demand from the grid. So when you demand more power from the grid, that's in effect pulling more heat off the reactor and it increases the reaction and produces the power to meet that. And then if the grid demand slows down, it's pulling less off the reactor, the reactor gets hotter and it self-regulates itself down. So I really like that because meeting the ups and downs of the grid is a pretty major problem and those new fast reactors will do that. Oh, sorry. Oh, okay. Um, okay. Yeah. Okay. Don't 
to what extent, my impression has been that the cost and long timelines for building nuclear reactors is, is part due to um, regulation here in this country. And to what extent do, do some of these new types of reactors get around that more broadly, what if anything is being done in, in the regulatory arena to make it easier and cheaper, faster to build reactors? Well, good question. The Nuclear Regulatory Commission here um, is very much oriented to the traditional light water reactors, that's what we have now. Um, and all their voluminous regulations are about that. And then if you come in proposing to build, uh, like Oklo did, some different kind of reactor, they're like, well, we don't know what that is. You know, so they, they're not very well set up. Congress really wants to build these new reactors. Both parties have got a struggle, just passed, one of the bills just passed Congress in the last few years, excuse me, passed the House of Representatives in the last few days. Um, and the vote was 393 to 13, I think. So it's overwhelming bipartisan support for it, from Cory Booker on the left to uh, Jim Inhofe, he's not in anymore, on the right, the guy that threw the snowball in the Senate to show the climate change didn't matter. Um, but, you know, really a lot of support from both, from both sides. Um, and they want the NRC to, to update, keep pushing them to do it, but the NRC is a big bureaucracy and it's gone really slowly. The Canadian Nuclear Safety Commission, um, the equivalent up there, is more technical, less political, less bureaucratic, and American companies have started to go to Canada to build their reactors. That's why this GE reactor is being built in Canada, not in the United States to start with. I, I don't like it all, so. um, How do you overcome all the political resistance uh, after the Fukushima disaster? Uh, Angela Merkel in Germany decided to close all the nuclear plants. And nuclear is still a dirty word, especially in Western Europe, I think. Although in Holland now, that's where I'm raising it from, they're talking about uh, building a few more, which is really surprised me. But uh, I think it's a no brainer, but there's so much resistance to overcome. I went to the Netherlands five years ago and gave a couple of talks there. And my book got translated into Dutch, and I'm sure that's why they changed their policy now. <laughs> and I built some reactors there. There's a lot of change going on now. Poland, especially, really going big into nuclear power now. But also the Netherlands. Sweden is now going to build new reactors again. France is going to build new ones. Um, Canada, um, South Korea is getting back in big time. So there's a lot of changes in the last few years. Um, Germany, not so much. <laughs> Germany is pretty I set. To, I seem to have heard that they may not be closing some of them. They've closed all of them now. And they Germany, yeah. Um, Belgium said they were going to close them all and they decided to keep two of them that are right on the French border open. It's not very much to hold on to, but it's a couple of them will still be going. Um, it's hard when you have the politics that you have in some of these countries where the Green Party is just dead set against nuclear power, it's just in their DNA. And you get a government, this happened in Sweden, for instance, where the party that comes into power depends on the Green Party votes to get the majority to be in power. Right? So they only have a, not that many seats in parliament, but those are necessary to form the government. So it kind of left party with the Green Party, and this is true in Germany, it's true in Belgium. Um, and then the Green Party says, you know, we'll, we'll, we'll do whatever you want with your government, but you have to shut down the nuclear plant, so then they end up shutting them down. Um, we don't have that in the United States, not a parliamentary system, but that's been a real problem. I'm not sure what the answer is, actually. The Greens are starting to lose seats, maybe because of that. And Sweden had one of these governments, they were, they were like, oh, we're going to shut down nuclear power in Sweden. Crazy idea. But they were starting to do it. They started closing reactors. And then the other party, the uh, more conservative party, ran on an election platform. They were going to build more nuclear power plants, and they got elected. So um, I guess that's how it gets solved. Just so. But in Poland, the conservative party was in power, decided to build big time, a lot of nuclear power. And then they lost power to the more liberal party, which disagreed on everything except nuclear power. 
And so they're going to keep, with that program, building nuclear power. A little bit like the US Congress, where they can't agree on anything except they all like, you know, advanced nuclear. The micro plants that you described, do they require water cooling, or is there a different way of cooling? No. Is that the reason why you don't have the problem so much with an, with an overheat? Yeah. Um, they're air-cooled, and they have heat pipes. So it's a big problem in nuclear reactors, how you get the heat out from this very, very hot you know, core of the reactor, and then use it to make steam and electricity and whatever else you're going to do with it. Um, so they have heat pipes, which are a new technology, and they will draw the heat out um, without, move, without moving parts, use it for what's being used for, and then it goes to the air. So, I mean, that's important because if you're using water to cool it, which most of the reactors now do, then you're putting water back hotter than you took it out. And some people are worried about that now. We visited the nuclear plant in Sweden, and the local people loved that. They said that there's a lot of fish here, we like to swim in the plume of hot water next to the plant and so forth. But Americans don't necessarily see it that way. So. Um, Thank you for your thoughts. Uh, assume that uh, we build, call it a thousand reactors that are essentially a carbon copy of what are running the aircraft carriers for nuclear subs, and it, have been doing it for years. You avoid all the intellectual property issues. You avoid the issue of is this thing designed right. You ignore the political problems of somebody saying, we don't know how to do this, the Pentagon's always been wrong. And you don't have to raise the issue of, if we only do it like the French, we'll be OK. So why can't you do that when you can figure out a way to essentially hook them up like you hook up uh, uh, you know, things at Christmas and that you put on the Christmas tree? Uh, why isn't that better, or something like that, better than uh, even getting micro reactors from such nimble companies as Westinghouse, General Electric, and other assorted characters. Right. I had the same idea. It's great. But then I found there are some problems with it. And one is that the military reactors uh, are expensive. And I just told you, like, making it cheap is really all important. And the military does some things really well, but making stuff cheap is not really on the list. Um, and also, they don't want to give out the proprietary intellectual property behind those. Like the Navy is very secretive about those reactors, more so than it needs to be, I think. But, um, but they are going to have to get around that. Um, they do have a lot of experience. I mean, you have nuclear reactors here in Connecticut that are in the submarine fleet based in Groton. And so, in addition to the Millstone and the big nuclear plant, you've got a bunch of these little ones coming in and out of Connecticut all the time. And we kind of forget there's a hundred small nuclear reactors floating around in the US Navy. Um, and so you could use something like that, but it's not going to be the mass-produced cheap reactor that we need, I think. So uh, that there is one other advantage to it, and that is the US military is not subject to regulation by the Nuclear Regulatory Commission. <laughs> so that's a big thing. And I've talked with, there's a, there, I was just in the Pentagon a couple months ago talking with the Army nuclear program, which is like a couple of people, but they're trying to develop really small reactors for Army use. Things that are mobile, that you can take out to the field. And you know, logistics for fuel is just a nightmare for military forces out in the field, so this would solve all of that. And then they want to suck carbon out of the air, use their mobile nuclear reactor and make fuels, you know, so like your gas station could be making its own gasoline, kind of. Uh, but it's expensive. So um, something to work on, work with. You could power military bases that way, but it turns out there are some political and technical issues doing that. I think your, your uh, less focused on the cost issue then the discussion deserves, and costs come in different flavors. Uh, as an example, uh, as of July, our electric bills in Connecticut will rise around 800 million spread over time. 
uh, to recover the cost of millstones, higher expense. Uh, this is not every source's fault, uh, but uh, there will be a bump starting in July uh, in the delivery charge. It's not in the supply charge. Uh, the, uh, in the context of small modular reactors, uh, New Scale in Portland, Oregon, uh, has been developing its design of 600 million of federal funds since 2014. When the decision came, should we proceed, should the final investment decision proceed, the answer was no. There was no market for the electricity at the cost that was projected for it, so the project died. Uh, another kind of cost that I didn't hear any reference to is water availability. The only discussion of water is in water cooling versus air cooling and so forth. But all the designs that I'm familiar with are steam generators are involved, therefore condensers, therefore without adequate and cool enough cooling water, the efficiency degrades or has even resulted in the shutdown temporarily of nuclear units. So nowhere in the discussion uh, has there been a water availability for cooling. Uh, the biggest use of water in the United States, not surprisingly, is agriculture. Everybody gets that. The second biggest use of water in the United States is power generation. It's a big deal, particularly in the Southwest. So these are the kinds of things that I feel are, are insufficiently expressed. The caution that we ought to feel as we approach it. You mentioned Aqua, by the way. They have not gotten approval on their reactor design. So to say, to suggest they believe they'll be in service by 2030. I think that's a bit optimistic. Uh, so I, I, I'm, I'm not sure. How should we think about these issues of cost? And uh, uh, it's not good enough to just say, well, we'll get the cost down. But the history has not been gentle on that with nuclear. Well, it has for South Korea, it hasn't for the United States. We didn't build any reactors for 30 years, and then we tried to build this thing in Georgia. Um, no workforce, no experience, messed it up. The regulations kept changing after they started building it, and it was a financial fiasco and went way over budget. That was the first one. So um, your points are well taken, and I, certainly on the economic cost, that's a problem that has to get solved. I never really liked the new scale design because it didn't look like it would ever be cheap enough, and it turned out it wasn't. Um, and they were, they were the first one to get licensed because they looked the most like the existing plants. Um, the water issues, you know, the, in the southwest, the big plant out there, the Palo Verde in Arizona, um, uses wastewater from the city to cool the nuclear plant, which is kind of a nifty trick, but I don't think you can really scale that up so much. Um, the new plants use less water, and that's good, and, but most of the world's people live near the ocean, and most of the power is generated near the coast, so the ocean is it's big. So that's a good way to cool a reactor. That's why I think they initially chose the light water reactor design, because if you're designing it for submarines and aircraft carriers, um, you know, there's, water's a pretty good way to cool something when you're, when you're out there. Um, but those are the issues need to be solved. It's not like the, everything's just gonna happen magically. But conversely, all the other ways to make electricity have their own issues, and coal would have many, if not all, of those same problems uh, with water and so forth. I've got a follow on just briefly. Uh, one, one more question. Uh, the, uh, uh, I think your slide stated that the smaller reactors would produce less waste, the SMR designs. Uh, but National Academy of Sciences uh, 
published by the National Academy of Sciences peer review May of 22, uh, suggests that the amount of waste from SMRs uh, would be in the range of 2 to 30x that of a light water reactor for the same megawatt hours. That's for a light water or small natural reactor. But the fast reactors do produce less. There's still spent fuel at the back end of the thing under any reactor design. I just think it's so small and so manageable that that's not the main problem. Economics is the main problem. That's a real issue. If you're the Indian government and you need to give the people electricity or you won't get reelected, and you can do it with the fastest, cheapest, you know, best known, simplest way, which is coal, then that's what you're going to do. If something else is cheaper, then we'll consider that. And that's what we have to make nuclear be, but I agree it's not it's not yet or they'd be doing it. Nuclear power plants in war zones, such as the one in Ukraine. Um, I've been saying all along about that Ukraine plant. If I were in a war zone, the place I'd want to be is in a nuclear power plant because um, the one up the sh up the coast from Fukushima, and that when that tidal wave hit, that's where the villagers all went to take refuge because it's a sturdy, strong building. You, know, you can fly an airplane into a nuclear power plant, and the airplane will disintegrate, and the nuclear power plant will be okay. So is there a chance that a war could cause some release of low-level radiation? Yes. Is it going to cause a meltdown in a power plant? No. Um, I just feel like the war in Ukraine is such an atrocity, and there are so many things have gone on the last couple of years that are just so horrendous for people. And then you focus on this nuclear plant. You know, something might happen there and some radiation might get out. It just seems out of proportion completely. And in fact, it, it hasn't happened yet. But you, know, you want to do what you can and keep an eye on it. To some extent, nuclear power professionals on both sides of the line kind of think alike. And the Russians came in to run the plant. The Ukrainians are still working there. They've made it work so far. Um, and, but it's a danger, but I just don't think either compared to, mostly compared to the war, the rest of the war, you know, think about what's happening there, it's so much worse than anything that could happen with that power plant. It seems a misplaced focus. Two more questions. Two more questions. Three more. Three more. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Uh, one of the things that hurt us the last time around with nuclear power is our own sense of capitalism. And you would have a different part needed and you couldn't get it because it wasn't the right part. Do you think there's any chance we will get to the place that we can, as America, work together to have one design that would really make it cheap enough to be viable? That's what we need to do. And I'm not quite sure politically how we get there, but you're absolutely right. France built the same design over and over again. South Korea built variations of the same design over and over again, and that's why it's cheap. The United States built every, you know, like, I don't think there's more than four reactors of the same design in this country. And the head of the NRC made a crack decades ago that the French have two kinds of reactor and hundreds of kinds of cheese. And in the United States, it's the opposite. <laughs> so we have to get past that. But we don't have a system where the, the places where nuclear powers roll out really fast, there's a stronger central government and less of this kind of anarchic, capitalistic approach to it. And I'm not sure of the answer to that uh, for the United States. It's possible that this will all happen elsewhere in the world and kind of bypass the United States. Um, you know, if China alone would build out its nuclear reactor fleet and displace all its coal plants, it would be by far the biggest thing we've ever done to combat climate change. And they can do it because they're a centralized government. After that, if the Chinese are doing it, then the Americans would probably wake up and oh no, we need to do it too. Maybe we'd have a positive kind of space race uh, thing going on. Just following up on that point you were making, um, 
seems like one of the, the biggest problems we have for a lot of issues in our country is the lack of trust of institutions, whether they're the private sector or the public sector. So if you had your magic wand, how would you allocate the responsibilities between the private sector and the public sector for uh, maximizing innovation and cost efficiency versus safety and regulation and uniformity? That's a hard question, too. In uh, the Scandinavian countries, like in, in Finland, where they just built a new nuclear reactor, and Sweden is the same thing. The people trust the government. It's kind of bizarre, you know, to us Americans, but they really trust their government. There's a different sense of social cohesion, and it makes it easier to do a big thing like that. Um, I guess if I had my way, I would declare energy to be vital national infrastructure, and I'd deal with it like the state interstate highway system. You know, have the government build it. Um, on the other hand, the government's not that good at bringing costs down. So. If you look at NASA versus SpaceX, you know, it was SpaceX that was able to get space flight much cheaper. So then I changed my answer and said, no, I can keep the government out of it, turn it all over to private. Or maybe like SpaceX, you could have the government buying the power, but the company's producing it. I think you need some combination of that. And I don't think we have it yet. And I'm not sure myself quite what it should look like. Please, uh, we are, we still have books uh, to, that Joshua is going to sign, so I think we have to stop the Q&A. Thank you so much for all of the wonderful questions. Thank you. Thank you so much. It's a pleasure to be here. If anybody wants to follow up by email, that's my email address, and I'd love to hear from people. Thank you.